At the tail end of summer in 1613, a minor courtier died during a period of imprisonment in the Tower of London. Initially, Sir Thomas Overbury's death was considered to be the result of illness, but almost three years later, the testimony of an apothecary's assistant emerged, stating that Overbury had been poisoned. An investigation was launched with suspicion alighting on the Earl and Countess of Somerset, and the Countess confessed to the murder. The Countess, otherwise known as Frances Carr, née Howard, is a fascinating figure. Cast as the poster girl for wicked women of the time, she was an infamous beauty, scion of a powerful family, surrounded by scandal, and remembered as a murderer, a witch, and a whore. Well, let's get into it. Welcome, my loves, to Poisonous Affairs. I'll be discussing the sordid details of some of the most talked about scandals that rocked the 17th century French and English courts. It's all about lust, power, greed, and murder. <laughs> We're moving away from France and the French court and traveling across the pond to England, my friends. And boy, do I have a story to tell. Whew! Get ready. A famous beauty, Frances Carr, née Howard, was born in 1590. She eventually became the Countess of Somerset, and she was involved in a sensational 17th century English scandal. Now, I want to talk about... I, I said Frances Carr. That was her second husband's last name, Carr, but she was Nea Howard. So throughout much of English and later British history, the Howards have played an important role. They claim descent from Hereward the Wake, the resister of the Norman conquest, who has been much celebrated in folklore. Now John Howard fought to the death at the Battle of Bosworth Field in defense of the cause for the House of York. Now they regained favor eventually with the new Tudor dynasty, after leading a defense of England from Scottish invasion at the Battle of Flodden. I know, I'm just throwing a whole bunch of battles here, there, and everywhere, but you're probably familiar with Catherine Howard. Now, Catherine, unfortunately, became the fifth wife and queen consort to, you guessed it, King Henry VIII. So why do I say unfortunately? Well, because like her cousin, Queen Anne Boleyn, Catherine's head met the executioner's block. Catherine was beheaded with the executioner's axe, unlike her cousin, Anne, who was executed by an expert swordsman from Saint-Omer in France. Whew! What a family, friends. What a family. Now let's get back to Frances, now that you have an idea a little bit of her family history. I mean, I could talk about her father, her mother, blah, 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 but... That's way too many names, and we're already confused, as is. If you're not confused, I'm fucking confused. Don't worry about it. I should have prefaced by saying listener's discretion is strongly advised, but I think you're pretty used to that by now, so... <laughs> but listener's discretion is strongly advised. Now, Frances Howard was married young. Some places I read she was married at 13, others say she was married at 14. It doesn't really matter. What you need to know is that she was married at a very young age. Now, she married the equally young Robert Devereux, third Earl of Essex. Their marriage was more political than love, and it united two warring factions at court. It is said that James I of England, who was also James VI of Scotland, was significantly involved in the marriage project. Now, in the presence of the king, the wedding was celebrated at Whitehall Palace. As I mentioned, the pair were young, which was unremarkable for aristocratic marriages of the period. When children married in this way, they usually didn't live together until about the age of 16, when the girl was sufficiently mature to make childbirth less risky. It was still fucking risky, my friends, but it was less risky. So Essex was sent abroad for a few years to be educated in the sophisticated manners of the European court. The problem is when the young couple were finally reunited, they found out that they didn't like each other at all. 
We also need to take into account that during Essex's absence, the power balance at court had shifted. The Essex faction was losing their influence, and the Howards identified this as a new opportunity. Mm, mm, mm. Scheming, as always. During the time that Robert, Earl of Essex, was away, Francis had fallen in love with Robert Carr, first Earl of Somerset. The plot thickens, I know. So Francis decided to take the step to annul her marriage. Was it Francis or was it her family? Who knows? But anyway, unable to legally represent herself, her father and her uncle, Henry Howard, Earl of Northampton, represented her and drew up the libel. The situation quickly attracted public attention. She claimed that she had made every attempt to be sexually compliant for her husband and that, through no fault of her own, she was still a virgin. She was examined by ten matrons and two midwives who found her hymen intact. Now, it's widely rumored at the time that Sir Thomas Monson... Uh, please remember Sir Thomas over here. So that Sir Tom, uh, Thomas Monson's daughter was a substitute, which is possible because she had requested, Francis over here, requested to be veiled during the examination for modesty's sake. So I don't know how close she got to the first Earl of Somerset over there sexually, but she managed, she managed somehow to maybe do a switcheroo. Who knows? The matter was a subject of mockery throughout the court. Somewhat inevitably, it was Francis rather than Essex who bore the brunt of the public shaming surrounding the annulment trial. She was believed by many to have made her husband impotent by the use of witchcraft. <clears throat> In turn, Essex over here claimed that he was capable with other women but was unable to consummate his marriage. According to a friend, one morning, while chatting with a group of male companions, he had stood up and lifted his nightshirt to show them his erection. Is that what you learned as when you went to Europe for your manners, to just hoist up your nightshirt and show people your, your private parts? Lovely. Proving, if nothing else, that he was physically capable of arousal in the midst of your male companions. Interesting. No comment. So when asked why only she caused his failing, he claimed that, and I quote, she reviled him and miscalled him, terming him a cow, a coward, and a beast. The idea of satanic involvement was seriously considered by the judges, and at one point it was proposed that Essex should go to Poland to see if he could be unwitched. The annulment took a while and possibly would not have been granted if it were not for the king's intervention. You see, the guy that Francis fell in love with, Somerset, <laughs> he was the quote-unquote favorite of King James. <laughs> mm. Don't you just love the sordid details of people's lives? Am I the only one who just likes this kind of stuff? I'm just like, mm, give me more, give me more. So you're probably thinking, what about the guy that died in the tower? How is he involved in all of this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take it back a few years. <laughs> so Robert Carr and Thomas Overbury met in Edinburgh in 1601. At the time, Carr was aged 14. Sounds a bit problematic, but okay. And was a page to the Earl of Dunbar while Overbury was around 20 and was on holiday from studying law in London. Now, the pair were both of the same class, the landed but not noble gentry, and they struck up a friendship. When Carr headed to London four or five years later, the friendship was renewed. By this time, Overbury had managed to secure a small position at court, but he soon realized that the charismatic, though less intelligent, Carr was likely to prove far more successful. So he positioned himself as the young man's mentor. So, as a close friend and advisor of Somerset, Carr eventually became Somerset, he tried to advise Somerset not to marry Francis Howard. But the Howard family and their allies were powerful. 
the Howard faction persuaded the king to offer Overbury the post of ambassador to Russia, knowing he would refuse in order to stay in England by Somerset's side. When he did so, the king viewed this as an insult and imprisoned Overbury in the Tower of London, where he eventually died. Finally, the king granted the annulment of her marriage to Essex. It went through 11 days after Overbury's death in September 1613. So let's talk more about Overbury, um, more specifically how he died. I'm going to link all the articles I used. Now, two of these articles talk about all the accomplices, and I decided to leave those out because I didn't want to bore you too much. And also, it would add more names, which might confuse you. I mean, to be honest, it confused the hell out of me. <laughs> but let's talk about Overbury's death over here. 18 months later, in the summer of 1615, a Yorkshire apothecary's assistant confessed on his deathbed that he had been paid 20 pounds by the countess to supply her with poisons to murder Overbury. Now, James I's secretary of state, Sir Ralph Winwood, brought the accusations to the king's attention, and James, in turn, urged his privy council to investigate the matter. The subsequent investigation and trial revealed that Francis had been secretly poisoning Overbury for some time before his death by smuggling jellies and tarts into his chamber tainted with white arsenic and other toxic compounds. Mmm, 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 mmm. Now the lieutenant of the tower, Gervais Helways, Helways, we're going to go by Gervais over here, admitted that he had received a confession from Overbury's keeper, Richard Weston, that he had been bribed by the countess to administer the poison. Gervais intercepted the tainted sweets at one point and from then on took the precaution of having Overbury's food prepared in his private kitchen, taking care to intercept any other food before it could reach Overbury. For fear of the Countess's political influence, and because his own patron was Francis's great-uncle, Henry Howard, 1st Earl of Northampton, he took no action against her. But Francis eventually succeeded in poisoning Overbury with a smuggled enema, laced with mercury chloride. My, my, my. Death by enema. Now, Overbury's murder is far from straightforward. There were a number of powerful people for whom Overbury's death was convenient, including Francis's husband, Robert Carr, and even possibly the king. Now you're asking yourself, why would the king be involved? Well, you see, Robert Carr was King James's, as I mentioned before, quote-unquote, favorite. And the king did have a few other favorites that happened to be male. He also had a mistress, and he fathered children with his queen. Now, whether or not people knew of King James's bisexuality, we really don't know. But at the time, it would be considered scandalous. You see, the English and French co courts were a little bit different. So <laughs> who knows? And let's not forget that Overbury was a very close friend of Carr. And what do friends do? They gossip, don't they now? So Overbury might have known a few secrets. So Francis and her husband were arrested for the murder in mid-October 1615. The trial revealed that Francis had supplied the poisoned enema to Richard Weston through an intermediary, Francis's waiting woman and companion, Mrs. Anne Turner. Now, get this, Anne was the widow of a physician and the madam of two brothels known to be frequented by many at court. Oh my... She was a wealthy and well-connected woman, and she was, as I mentioned, a waiting woman to Francis. Now, unfortunately for Anne, a search of her premises turned up a stash that contained both pornography and heretical material, which was enough evidence for a court at the time to convict anyone of anything. So rather than face the excruciating death of a heretic, which I assume would be what? She would probably be burned, quartered or vice versa, behead, I don't know. But anyway, rather than facing that death, she confessed to her part in the murder and gave up her sources for the poison. 
As a result, she was only hanged. Now, remember Gervais? Well, he was tried as an accessory, and his patron at court, Sir Thomas Monson, remember when I said remember that name, was arrested and imprisoned for involvement. Between mid-October and December 1615, Gervais, Turner, Weston, and the apothecary James Franklin were all found guilty as accessories to murder and hanged. Monson twice had his trial delayed in November and December of 1615, before prosecution was ultimately dropped. Hmm, suspicious? Who knows? Now, Frances Somerset admitted her complicity in the crime. However, her husband maintained his innocence. So in 1616, Frances was found guilty of murder, while her husband was found guilty of being an accessory after the deed when it was proven that he burned incriminating documents and made bribes to cover up his wife's involvement. The couple were sentenced to death initially, but later confined to the tower for life on the orders of King James I. They received a pardon from the king um, in January 1622 and were subsequently released from prison. Now, Frances, she died 10 years later at the age of 42 quite the scandal my my now see the thing is that all of this is shady as shit because there were a few people who wished overbury out of the way there were cover-ups and shady plea bargains that obscured the real circumstances of the case in the end was Frances howard the wicked woman she is reputed to have been i'll let you be the judge of all of that I hope you enjoyed this episode of Poisonous Affairs. Tune in on Friday for the next episode. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. I'll add the links to the show notes as well as the articles. Remember that life is stranger and more fucked up than fiction. Stay safe, my friends. 